Hi, everyone. Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I am Joanne Ezermoel, and today I will be presenting Paris, a supply chain persona. For those of you who are watching the lecture live, you can ask questions at any point of time via the YouTube chat. I will not be reading the chat during the lecture. However, at the very end of the lecture, I will be getting back to the chat and do my best to answer the question that I found there. So the, the topic of interest uh, for us today is uh, supply chain and fashion. Or more precisely, what can supply chain do for fashion? And here, uh, whenever you know, I, I open um, supply, chain, uh, supply chain books, I usually find you know, something like um, five lines, a paragraph maybe, to actually discuss um, the, the specific challenges that we face. And then the, the book goes on with a whole chapter to discuss, uh, to discuss the solution, or, or uh, I would say an ingredient of the solution. And um, the, the solution might be something like uh, time series forecasting, or open to buy, or um, SNOP. But, but really, when we have this sort of, of imbalance between um, the, the, the problem side of things and the solution side of things, uh, I really reflect about the, the imbalance and whether we have you know, really an adequacy of uh, the solution that are being proposed with regard of the problem. And so that will be the whole point of, uh, of, um, of, the, of the persona that we'll discuss today, uh, Paris, uh, a, a woman fashion brand that we, that we'll, de that we'll um, cover in great detail in the following. And so the problem will be really to uh, analyze at large you know, the, the, the sort of problems that can be found in fashion. And so the, the challenge for me is to make a presentation that kind of makes sense. You know, how are we organized to all those, uh, all those problems? If, we, if I just list you know, a gigantic catalog of all the problems that are, that are faced by, by fashion company, I will probably end up with something that is barely making sense. So um, the way I've decided to, um, to go through with this exercise is to take the angle of the novelty. So fashion at its core is very much driven by, uh, by novelty. And, um, and fashion itself is a very you know, subtle and nuanced phen phenomenon where it's always kind of the same, but always kind of different as well. And, um, and the point of this lecture will not be to, to be you know, a lecture about, uh, about fashion itself and exactly its inner dynamics, but rather on how exactly does this uh, dynamics articulate with, um, with the supply chain changes that we are, that we are facing. And the way I propose to journey through all the series of problems that are faced by many supply chain companies is to basically go through um, the life cycle of the product itself. And that's exactly what we'll do to journey through the life cycle of the products that are you know, um, designed, produced, and so on by, uh, by Paris, this fictitious company. And so um, the story so far, this uh, lecture is a second lecture of the second chapter in this whole series of supply chain lectures. The whole plan is available online for those that are uh, interested. We have already concluded the first, uh, the first chapter that was a prologue where I gave my general views about um, supply chain, um, both as a field of study and as a practice. And what we have seen in this first, um, in this first chapter is that um, the improvement of uh, supply chain is essentially a wicked problem by opposition to uh, tame problems. And so, um, uh, methodology is really of, of very, very high importance. Uh, and and uh, as a rule of thumb, most you know, naive uh, methodologies just um, uh, thoroughly fail as far as supply chain are, are concerned, just, just due to, to the weakened nature of the problem. And so, um, in, uh, in, uh, in the last lecture, in the previous lecture, we, uh, I discussed that at length, taking you know, a, a qualitative uh, uh, angle that I will continue today. And I introduced the notion of supply chain uh, persona. Um, so if, you've, if you didn't have the chance to see the previous lecture, then probably the lecture of today will probably make more sense once you've seen the previous lecture. But nonetheless, I will do a, a tiny recap in a minute just to, uh, to make sure that you're not completely lost if, if, if this lecture, you're watching this lecture without having seen the previous lecture first. But, uh, and, uh, and today, uh, in, this, uh, in this second lecture for this, uh, for this uh, chapter on, on methodology, we will basically go into the specifics of, uh, of fashion as far as um, uh, supply chain changes are concerned. So a first tiny recap that, uh, about something that I, that I introduced in my very first lecture. 
um, I propose to define um, supply chain as uh, the mastery of optionality in presence of uh, viability when uh, managing the flows of uh, physical goods. Um, I will be using in what follows, I will be using this definition to you know, establish what constitute or not you know, uh, 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 a relevant supply chain problem. And by, uh, by optionality, I refer to, to options, and, and more specifically, you know, the sort of well-defined uh, decisions that happen to be narrow in scope. The, just to give you uh, an example, if, uh, for example, we ask the question of whether we should move one unit of a given product from a given distribution center to a given store today, this is clearly, you know, an option that is on the table. Uh, this is a very, you know, well-defined decision, narrow in scope. Uh, and then at the other end uh, of the spectrum, we have a decision such as, for example, um, um, what about changing the logo of the company or of the brand? Um, but, but this is the opposite because in terms of scope, there are tons of ramification. And if you change the logo, maybe you will have to adapt the very design of, of the products because maybe the, 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 the design the, of the fashion products even play with the logo in subtle ways. And so there is no such thing as just, you know, a, a, a copy and paste of a, of a new logo. This, this is, I would say, pretty much the opposite of, of having an option that is really a work of, of profound creativity and that will probably challenge uh, pretty much everything in the visual identity of the brand. So just to clarify, you know, what is, what is actually uh, um, being discussed here. And then um, the idea of the supply chain persona, it's, it's fundamentally a format to convey, um, you know, um, uh, supply chain knowledge. Ideally, you know, something that would be, that would have scientific-like attributes. We can get, uh, and, and I suggest to go back to the previous lecture to, for, I would say, the extensive discussion about that. And the idea is that a persona is a, a fictitious company. And there are, there are two really important angles at play here. It's a, it's a fictitious company out of, uh, by necessity, because if we were discussing an actual, a real company, then we will be facing problems. Um, we will be facing, I would say, with real people and, uh, and, and real clients, and et cetera. We will be facing tons of problems that are of the kind of, of all the taboos that we can face when we want to discuss about real living people. And um, so that's why it is uh, a fictitious company. And then, uh, we will exclusively focus uh, the analysis on the problem side of things, as opposed uh, to discuss, you know, the solution side of things. I would say almost exclusively. We will see that there can be, you know, minor exception to this rule. But, uh, and the key reason is that by focusing on the problem, we can avoid all the problems that are basically conflict of interest. You know, whenever somebody in supply chain end up advocating for one solution rather, rather than another one, there are tons of conflict of interest at play, and, um, and that's exactly the whole point of personalized to eliminate the entire, all those, those conflict of interest by, by purely focusing on the problem side of things. And obviously, the persona is trying to you know, magnify the things that are the most relevant, and that's, that's exactly what we are about to do for, uh, for Paris. So Paris is uh, you know, a fictitious uh, woman uh, fashion brand, that operates a fairly large retail network. So on this slide, I've, I've gathered a series of you know, KPIs just to give you a sense of what sort of company we're talking about. All of that is, is fictitious and made up. And uh, I give you, you know, a few seconds so that you can read this slide and, uh, a, 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 and capture a bit the essence of this company. Let's discuss a bit um, all those numbers and why I picked those numbers in particular. Um, so one billion euro for the annual turnover. Well, it turned out that I found that it's, it's quite characteristic of the sort of scale that characterize the brands that you will find uh, most routinely you know, in malls or shopping centers, both in Europe or North America. And, uh, and it also characterizes a certain set of problems. If we were looking at companies that would be you know, one order of magnitude larger, say 10, 10 billion euro per year, then we would probably be looking at some sort of worldwide giants that are um, very frequently quite vertically integrated, uh, which is not the case of, uh, of, um, of, this, uh, of Paris here. And then if we were looking uh, at, comp at a company that was you know, an order of magnitude smaller with 100 million euro turnover, then usually it tend to be a specialist of some kind with a very specific angle 
to attack the market, which again tend to, I would say, steer away from, I would say, the, the mainstream fashion brand that we try to capture here through this persona. Um, the 3% the EBITDA just reflects, you know, the reality that uh, fashion is a tough market. There are very few companies that have, you know, enormous profitability. Usually the, the margins are relatively thin. They are not non-existent, but they are relatively thin. And that's, that's quite, interest, that's quite uh, interesting for us because uh, it also means that um, supply chain matter very much. Obviously, when you have like a 3% EBITDA, if you can generate, if you can, you know, increase this by just 1%, you've just, you know, increased the amount of profit by one third. So that, that's typically a sort of situation where, where supply chain really shine. And obviously, if you take a company that is losing a lot of money, then most likely the, the problem is, might be, you know, dysfunctional supply chain, but it might be all sort of things that are, where, that, where supply chain is pretty much powerless. So that's, that's quite interesting. The 50% uh, uh, initial gross margin on the catalog price and then the 20% the discount are again kind of, I would say, um, uh, relatively representative of the sort of things that are observed in, in this market. So, so products, when they are sold, you know, uh, initially there, there is uh, a, a sizable margin, you know, that nothing is extravagant. This is not about selling um, uh, software. Uh, but it's sizable, uh, but then uh, the company is not nearly as profitable uh, because, well, there is um, the, the uh, end of season sales where there are substantial discounts that are given away at the end of every collection. And then uh, I assume that uh, an e-commerce is present and that it's something like 10% of the volume. So the e-commerce is actually, the e-commerce store is the biggest store of the network, but this is not, um, this is not a persona about, you know, uh, an e-commerce company. Again, there is a matter of choice here. Um, if we were to talk about uh, an e-commerce company, uh, that would be very interesting, but that would be maybe another persona. So we assume that we, here we have, a, we have a company that emerged in the, the late 20th century. It, it is not a company that was a digital native. Um, the e-commerce the e is very much an afterthought. It emerged later. It has grown rapidly, but it's still, you know, uh, uh, it's, it, it is still not dominant in the picture. And what is dominant is obviously the main channel, which are the 1,000 stores. And, and what is very interesting here is that if you, if you say that you have like 1,000 stores for 1 billion euro of turnover, if you just do the math, you would see that um, on average, a store is, is uh, 1 million euro per year. So, so it's, it's, it's reasonably small. I mean, we are, we are talking about, uh, about boutiques, not, uh, not superstores here. And again, that is very, uh, this is the sort of things that are very frequent in the world of fashion, uh, especially mid-market fashion. And, um, and, and here, even more interesting is that if, if the average store is at 1 million euro per year, then most, most likely, you know, the, the, median, uh, the median store is only, you know, half a million euro per year of turnover. And actually, when you look at, at, at Paris, what you typically found uh, is uh, you have like power stores. So stores that happen in terms of, of square meters to be quite small, but exceedingly well placed. It's the sort of store that you will find, you know, uh, for example, in, in train stations or very busy areas of, of, um, of high profile cities. And so there are stores that are small in size, but big in sales volume. And uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, you have stores that are maybe suburban, that are much bigger in terms of square meters, but in terms of sales volume, uh, they, are, um, they, are, they are much lower. And you see the paradox is that the, the, the stores that sell the most are also the, the stores that are the, the smallest. We'll be getting back to that. But, uh, but there is an interesting uh, dynamic here at play. And then we have two distribution centers. Uh, obviously, I, I choose to have one in, in France and one in Germany. The, the company operates you know, in six countries, so it's, it's, it's relatively you know, concentrated in terms of geographies, but still, you know, we're, we're talking of, uh, of servicing something that is you know, a, a thousand kilometers you know, uh, east, uh, east, to, east to west, north to south. So, so there is a lot of, I would say, of, of, of territories to, um, to cover. And, um, and here, the, the ratio that is of interest is that one distribution center is serving several hundreds of stores. And again, this sort of ratio um, is, is very commonly found in, in fashion and is completely different, for example, of what you will find in, uh, let's say, for, um, for hypermarkets, for example. And then in terms of, of offering, what we are looking at, we are looking at, um, at 1,000 products, distinct products, you know, at, uh, at any point of time, served by, by the network. 
but if you look at, uh, but it's very important to differentiate, you know, the products and the variants. The variants are basically the products, but just expanded down to every um, size and color combination. And you would see that when you go from products to variants, you basically inflate uh, the number of references uh, by an order of magnitude. And that, that's quite interesting. And then in terms of novelty, as I was describing, well, we can have the, let's assume that we have the, the classic, you know, four collections a year. And, and we have, as a rule of thumb, in, in women fashion, we have about two-thirds of the products that are, that are new at every collection and one-third that are continuation of what, what we had before. If we were discussing about uh, men's fashion and that would be a men's fashion persona, the ratio of novelty would be maybe a, a little bit lower. But uh, the essence is here we have uh, the, the, the majority of the products for every collection is actually products that have never been sold before. Even if, you know, this is fashion, products are always variations of some kind with regard to what was done before. So let's start the journey of, um, of the product life cycle with, um, with range planning. So at, at the very, very start of a collection, of the inception of a collection, there is maybe, you know, a list of uh, stylistic ideas or styles, you know. Um, obviously, when I say 50 styles, it's not, this number should not be understood as, you know, an exact number. It's more, it's more uh, the idea, what, the idea that I want to convey is that we have a, um, a few, you, we might have, you know, a few dozens of, um, of, of ideas, of design ideas, or stylistic ideas, but we don't have hundreds, you know, we have, and those, those are basically, uh, what will make, you know, the, 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 the collection, that will give the, the, the theme of the collection, if you want. And then, based on these uh, 50 or so, you know, stylistic ideas, this, um, they will be gradually inflated to be turned into uh, the 10,000 um, 10, 10, variants that we have at the end when we want to build the, the wall assortment. And, uh, and the proposition that I have for you is that, um, the, the transition e, uh, from those 50 stylistic ideas to the 10,000, you know, um, uh, variants are that, that represent the, the assortment as a well whole is at least in, in a very good part a supply chain problem. Um, I don't want to deny, you know, the fact that there might be a great deal of design skills to basically, you know, uh, to, to basically uh, derive, you know, uh, um, uh, from a stylistic idea, a given product. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there is clearly a point where th the problem becomes, uh, of, of this range planning becomes a supply chain problem. And if only, you know, if we, w at the, you know, at the, at the end of the process, we have, for example, to decide of exactly the, the uh, all the sizes that we will want to have. And obviously, we might decide that for every single product, we have the whole range of sizes. But maybe not. Maybe there are some products that don't justify to have seven different sizes. Maybe for some products, we will stick to only three sizes. And, and so you see, there is, there is a, a lot of options on the table. Remember, the, the supply chain is about this mastery of optionality. For example, the sizes are very much all those options. And there is um, a, a very large number of options that are uh, pretty much all very obvious on the table. But, uh, but we have to decide. And, and deciding exactly the fine print of options is, uh, I mean, it's not exactly a matter of, of, of sheer creativity. You really have to, to, to fit your market, to, to fit, you know, supply and demand. And then uh, same things, the same similar sort of things could be said about the colors. Obviously, you know, um, design will have a lot to say about the choice of colors. But in the end, we have to decide for every single product whether we have, you know, one color, two colors, or, or 20. And maybe all the options are possible. It's not just a matter of, of design. There is this question of having, you know, uh, of balancing, you know, the, 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 the supply and the demand. That is very, very much present. And I will, I will do, you know, as although I said as a rule that we want to discuss, you know, the, 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 to have the analysis that focus on, on the problem side of things, I will maybe do a tiny jump onto uh, the solution just to basically quote uh, a fairly recent paper, research paper from, from Facebook, which is very, very interesting. And this is uh, design inspiration from uh, generative networks. And what, what this team at Facebook has done is they have literally built a, a, a program, a software program, that is capable based on, on a data set of, uh, of fashion, you know, uh, pictures to generate, you know, dynamically new designs. And that's, that's very interesting because if we go back to this idea of, you know, range planning, we start with stylistic ideas, we see 
that um, you know uh, it's not science fiction to think that a, a great deal can, uh, of, of work can be done in, in ways that are profoundly automated and optimized, even you know going back to uh, the actual generation of new styles. And uh, in particular, there are also other publications that, that I'm not going to, uh, to discuss today that explain how we can, uh, successes have been achieved in doing some style transfer. So it's possible to literally take a t-shirt, identify the sort of style that there is in terms of pattern on the t-shirt, and then transfer it automatically and apply the same style to, let's say, a, a dress, for example. So that's, that's very interesting because suddenly things that, that looked as, as being, you know, uniquely that, that looked as if they were only uh, belonging to the realm of pure design and pure creativity, we see that if we have tools, then suddenly they become like options that can be exploited at will with um, little you know, infrastructure in place, except, except the software that we have to basically do this work for us. So that's, that's just the point that I wanted to discuss, is just that there is really in this range planning, there is actually maybe a, a very good portion of this work should be actually considered as a, as a very much as a supply chain problem, just because it's just a matter of, of exploiting options that are on, on the table. Now, what are you know, the, the drivers that, that define you know, what would be a good or bad assortment? And, and here we have to, to look at the drivers. And the drivers are, um, first, we want to have a, an extensive coverage. So you see, um, every single new pro extra product that we add to the assortment is the opportunity to please you know, one extra fraction of, of some clientele that we would be able to capture via you know, a, an extended assortment. So basically, uh, a bigger assortment is more or less, I mean, something that will intuitively, you know, steer us into capturing a bigger portion of the demand. But then we also have an effect of diminishing returns because for every single product that we introduce, um, there will be some kind of, of, of cannibalization taking place. You see, for example, uh, um, a super classic would be a, a small, you know, black dress. Uh, that's you know a, a very typical product. So if you introduce one first black dress, um, there will be most likely be uh, uh, you know some demand for it. But if you introduce a second black dress that has a, a slightly different you know cut, for example, then the question is that are we going to double the demand? Uh, probably not. We'll probably get a, a little more of demand, but you will see that many you know when when there is a client that walk into a store. Uh, she will maybe, you know, if she, she's seeking a black dress, she will just hesitate between the two and, and hopefully pick only one of the two, but maybe not both of them. So, so we see that the assortment is a, is a compromise. It's a trade-off between, you know, um, the fact that you can capture more and more demand with a bigger assortment, but you, you, have, a, you have cannibalization, a decision that takes place. And then uh, every single time we basically inflate the size of the assortment, we create extra, extra complexities, you know, for every single product that we that we add to a supplement. We'll have to to design and finalize the products. We need, you know, uh, to have nice digital pictures so that we can put the product on display for the e-commerce. Uh, we will need to have all the information. We'll be need to, um, to to have this product source produced, and then that will be, you know, a separate reference. And there, there might be plenty of, you know. Um, uh, uh, of process that uh, that is needed just to support every single product that we add. So and and there is no reason. I mean, we have some economy at scale, but uh, but as we are looking at something like a thousand plus, you know, products, we can we can think that we will rapidly, you know, exhaust those economies of scale, and those every single product that we add will incur, you know, linear cost, extra cost, while actually they will be like diminishing returns. But then. There are also plenty of, of non-linearities that we will explore um, that we'll explore later, uh, and by non-linearities I mean, for example, MOQs. Uh, the bigger the assortment, you know, the larger the assortment, the more difficult it will be to to basically purchase large quantities for every single product, and so it will become very difficult to reach those MOQs. I mean, it's always possible to reach the MOQ. You know, if we have an MOQ at 1,000 units, we can uh, we can always you know reach and order 1,000 units, but if the assortment is, is very large, then we will be mechanically at risk of ending up with a lot of overstocks just because we had to order more than what was really needed, just because we had to, um, to basically satisfy those uh, minimal order quantities, those MOQs constraints. So we see that we have plenty of, of drivers that, that, uh, that constraints what we can do uh, uh, with regard of this assortment. And then, 
And the idea is that when we want to project ourselves, you know, if we are building a assortment, is that we anticipate some kind of demand. That's why we, we, we put those products into the assortment. I'm not discussing exactly how we are going to specifically numerically anticipate this, this demand. But the thing is, um, there is a self profitic uh, effect that is here at play where you see it's uh, it's because we see that uh, there is a potential for demand that we cr we create and design and produce you know a product and then we will generate uh, the demand but um but there are the, there are strong self profitic effects such as for example um the 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 price where you know if you decide to introduce a product at a specific price um if you if you can think of a price that is um, that is lower then maybe you can have um, much more demand and then in turn, if you, have, if you expect much more demand, then you can produce uh, a larger quantities and leverage economies of scale at the, uh, at the production level. And because you have economies of scale, you can, produce, uh, um, you can produce at a cheaper price and in turn, you know, generate more demand. And, and the same things goes the, the opposite direction. So we have this tension uh, within the assortment that, you know, the bigger the assortment, the more we can cover internal demand, so the more appealing the assortment might be, but the bigger the assortment, the smaller the quantities that we'll have for every single product, and thus um, the less economies of scale we will enjoy when we will try to actually produce these products. And here, uh, this is so. This is you know the law, the law of supply and demand. You know economics 101. Uh, pretty sure that the audience has seen this curve you know hundreds of times. What is very interesting is that um, uh, we did we did uh, I witnessed you know a, a client of Locad a decade ago. Uh, and that was an e-commerce, uh, fashion e-commerce, to do, to do some tests in this area. And the question being tested was, um, uh, what happens, you know, when the, the price goes to zero? Will the demand go to infinity? And the surprising answer was a kind of yes, actually. Uh, when the price goes to zero, the, the, the demand, and the way they tested that, this e-commerce, this e is that they had, uh, they had products that they had acquired a bit accidentally, and the general consensus about those, those products that they were unsellable, you know, that, that the, it was, you know, the taste was awful, the colors were bad, the quality was crap, everything was, there, there was no redeeming qualities for those products. And so, but they, and so they, they thought that they, there was like literally no demand in the market for, for those sort of products. And so, uh, but they wanted to, to a bit test this hypothesis and thus they decided to put the products uh, on display on their website um, uh, with a price, a retail price of, of zero. And uh, and um, and then to uh, obviously clients, it was e-commerce still had to pay the, the 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 shipping fees, but other than that, you know, the product was free. And what was very surprising is that everything was near intensely liquidated, which kind of shown that the demand was uh, could go to extremely large quantities. It's not it's not so surprising because when you think about uh, about fashion, you know, even Paris is persona that is doing one billion a year. It's not even, you know, th this company is not even capturing, you know, 1% of the general fashion uh, market. So it's, it's, even if it's a very large company, it's still, you know, in terms of market share, a very small company. And so if, if you think in terms of uh, if you can really have a price that is vastly better than the rest of the competition, then the demand that you can observe can be, you know, one or two orders of magnitude greater than what you, what you usually experience. So... Uh, and, and by the way, um, also as a, as a side remark, uh, pricing, from my perspective, is very much a supply chain problem. Again, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, the sort of options, you know, you can decide to have a price that is higher or lower that will have profound influence on the amount of demand that you would observe. And so um, uh, supply chain you needs to be really to leverage all those options to, maximo to, to, to maximize um, all the values that you can generate uh, through, uh, by, through the company and the brand. Now, now that we have kind of established uh, our, um, uh, I would say, our assentment, we need to decide uh, uh, how we are going to, to produce it. And here, uh, Paris, as I pointed out, um, I am, uh, I'm taking, I'm making the, you know, the assumption that this company has completely, is completely outsourcing its production. So it, the company is relying on third-party suppliers, uh, dominantly located in Asia. Again, uh, this choice is motivated by the fact that it's, it's something that is uh, very frequent for, uh, for fashion companies, both in Europe and North America, for example. 
And, uh, and so the interesting thing is that uh, we have to start thinking about the lead times. And the lead times will be something of between you know, the, the generation of a purchase orders that is passed to a supplier and the, the reception of the goods will be something like four to six months. That's for the, for the total lead time of interest. However, um, if we look at only the transportation time, you know, uh, to have, you know, even if we, we ship uh, containers via the sea, we are only talking, talking about uh, from, you know, um, let's say, uh, China or Vietnam to, to Europe of something like 30, 30 days, 35 days. So um, uh, transportation time is, you know, a notable fraction of the lead time, but it's not actually the biggest part of the lead time. Um, and if we look, if we go back to this four, four to six months lead time, you will see that actually the bulk of the lead time is required so that the supplier can actually acquire their own, you know, uh, raw materials to, to produce, you know, the, um, the article, the merchandise, and, and they will need time to actually produce. And so um, we have to decide, you know, when it comes to, uh, at this point of the journey, we have to decide, we have an assortment, what we are going to buy in terms of, of quantities. And, and here, the first thing is that we have, uh, we have constraints. We have constraints. Um, the quantity we needs typically to, to be compliant with MOQs, you no know, minimal order quantities, but there are many flavors of MOQs, and usually most of them are, can, are, are, are to be found. So we can have, for example, an MOQ at the product level. Uh, we can have an MOQ at the variant level. So it's, it's down to the, the final you know, reference with uh, the variants in terms of size and colors. Um, we can have uh, an MOQ that apply at the, uh, at the purchase order level where, uh, for example, a supplier say, you cannot pass a purchase order to me if in total in aggregate it's not at least, uh, you know, 50,000 pieces. Uh, in, it can be also even more, you know, uh, sophisticated MOQs such as, for example, the supplier says, you can pick any color you want, but for every color you pick, uh, you, you need to have an MOQ that is expressed as 3,000 meters of fabric of this color. So you see, um, MOQs, it's not like one problem, it's a whole spectrum of constraints. And then um, we can also have very typically, you know, the price breaks, the fact that, you know, um, there are economies of scale, and so the supplier will tell you if you, if you buy of this product 1,000 units, the price is X, if you buy 5,000 units, the price is, is, uh, is Y, and if you buy 10,000 units, the Y is Z, et cetera, and, and you have like a, a, a you have a, a decreasing per unit price if you, if you go for looking for, for higher quantities. So what I want to point out is that uh, it's uh, uh, purchasing, the optimization of the purchase order is not just about having you know, one variant, one quantity, and this is it. There is, um, there is plenty of things that need to be accommodated, and, and there is uh, plenty of forces that are, that are at play. And um, obviously, we want all of that ultimately uh, to, uh, to, 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 to reflect you know, the capacity of the network to sell all those merchandise, but we'll be discussing those, those elements uh, in, a, in a moment. And now, once the purchase order is passed, the problem doesn't stop there. Now we have to think about, uh, about all the, the, the shipping angles. For example, uh, the, uh, Paris might have several suppliers that all happen to be uh, nearby in, in Vietnam, and there might be an interest to consolidate you know, those, uh, the production of those, of those suppliers into, um, into uh, containers, so that instead of having every single um, uh, supplier that, you know, that has to send full containers, you know, so, that it's, uh, so that the transportation costs are, are, are kept very, very low, here we can think about having, you know, multiple uh, the production of multiple suppliers that end up being consolidated into uh, into containers prior to the shipment. So to have this consolidation done in, done in Asia. Also, so that that is obviously one um, one option that is on the table. And then we have to to think in terms of, of transportation mode. Um, so obviously, you know, um, Paris being a, a mid-market, you know, a fashion brand. Uh, typically has to, uh, to convey the bulk of the merchandise through the sea for uh, economical reasons. However, it is very much possible for certain articles that are of higher value, you know, um, the, the, the cost that dominates when you want to transport articles through uh, the air is the weight, but uh, the cost that dominates, you know, uh, the, uh, when you want to transport through the sea, although it's, it's much cheaper at sea, is uh, the volume. And so um, when you look at, at something that you want to, uh, a shipment, 
it makes sense sometimes to have a mix and so to have like a full container that, that, that will arrive taking it all 30, 35 days or so uh, by the sea, but then to put a fraction to an aircraft uh, so that those, those, those materials will arrive earlier. And there, will be, there is maybe plenty of reasons uh, to do that, such as, for example, to, um, to solve an early stock out that, that the company that, uh, that Paris is already facing, or maybe to start you know, testing the water early and to, to sell the product, to, to put the product on display in the e-commerce so that you can test the water and have a better sense of what will ultimately be the demand uh, for those products. Or, uh, or maybe you know, to do a test run in the store themselves or um, some uh, quality assurance assessment. Et cetera. There is a whole uh, variety of reasons why you would like to do, not just you know, to choose one mode, but do a mix. And then um, there is the, the schedule, as we said, uh, the, the total lead time will be something um, four to six months, which means that uh, the company needs to be very uh, careful in its planning because most of the products that are being um, you know, uh, purchased have a seasonality of their own. And uh, it's pointless to have, let's say, a, wit uh, a, a winter coat that would arrive uh, in March. Uh, it's, it's way too late. You, you want the winter coat to arrive something like uh, in, in September in the distribution center so that it can be you know, put in the store uh, so that it could be in the store by October, just to give you an example uh, uh, here. And then in terms of schedule, the, the producer, should the producer you know, produce everything and ship everything at once? Or maybe if the quantity is allowed, the, it will make sense for the producer to start producing and then start to ship you know, container after container uh, uh, gradually, depending on what, uh, what is being produced and consumed uh, in, the, in the actual network. Then um, we have the problems of the master packs. Um, the master packs, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple idea, is that um, we can have uh, a mini assortment in a box. You know, typically a box uh, is going to contain, you know, the same variant, but just many units of the same variant. So a box might contain, you know, 200 t-shirts, for example. But, uh, but the question is, what about having one box uh, that is a mini assortment of its own? And that is, that is very interesting to do that because in terms of manhandling cost, it means that the, the box can be, you know, uh, can be sent to the distribution center, not be opened in the distribution center and be directly sent to the store. And that will reflect something that will be like the mini assortment that will be needed by the vast majority of stores. And that will save a, um, a, a lot of manhandling cost uh, by doing that. But on, on the minus side, uh, we are losing uh, a great deal of flexibility when we have, uh, we have, when we have master packs because uh, then we have something that is a bit more rigid because it's, it's, a, it's fundamentally a whole bundle of products that have to be sent to the stores at once. And we, do, we are losing the granularity, but nonetheless, this is an option that is always on the table um, and for practically any combination of, of products. Now, things have been purchased, things are on their way, and they arrive finally in the uh, inbound distribution center. And, um, and here, the, the first decision that will have to be made uh, with regard of, this, uh, of the distribution center, uh, yes, uh, one, one, uh, another angle that I didn't discuss is we have to decide where, what is the, the destination for the containers. Obviously, you see, we can decide that we will send containers to um, uh, w certain containers to the distribution center in Germany. And there are two, data uh, two distribution centers. We can decide to send a container to one distribution center uh, and, and then to, to alternate between the two. Or we can decide to send a container to uh, one distribution center and then uh, re-dispatch the excess quantity via trucks to the second distribution center. Again, we are speaking about Europe. It's not the two distribution centers. Are, um, are you know less uh, are, are about a day of road you know uh, in terms of distance so they are not very very far, but then there is uh, the question of of, uh, of the cross dock so the, the question is that if you have an incoming container that contains boxes that are both um, intended for the the, the French uh, distribution center and the German distribution center then you really want to do a cross-dock operation. So what you don't want to do is to have the container that arrive in your distribution center to unload all the, the boxes, put them in storage in the distribution center, and then pick them back to uh, ship them to, uh, to Germany. What you want is as you unload, you will directly on the dock, you know, cross-dock all the, all the boxes so that you can immediately resend them and avoid you know, many man and leg operations that would involve putting the box in storage and then taking it back. So that would be the first, uh, the, the first operation. And you have to do that for every single incoming 
container. Because even if initially you thought that this container was only intended for this di distribution center, maybe the situation, the market situation will have evolved, and then there is an opportunity to do a bit of a cross dock operation to, to, to do an immediate rebalancing of, of the merchandise as, as they arrive. Then you have to decide what you unpack. Obviously, for, um, for, 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 uh, for, for, for quality controls, you want to unpack some stuff. The things that you have to think is that as soon as you start unpacking you know, uh, the goods, it will take a lot more space. Uh, so that needs to be taken into account. Uh, but if you don't do that, then, uh, for example, the productivity can be, relatively, uh, uh, can be relatively low when it comes to uh, the picking, for example, for the e-commerce that you have to serve. And typically, the e-commerce e will have to be served um, uh, uh, from the distribution centers. Here, in this personnel, you see this is not a, a dominantly e-commerce company, so the e-commerce e uh, uh, expeditions are typically done from one of the two data centers. Uh, uh, not data center, distribution center, sorry. And so, uh, and obviously, we have to take into account, you know, the constraints uh, such as the storage capacity uh, of, uh, of, um, of the distribution center so that if we send many more, uh, a great deal of containers at, at a period of time just due to the collection, we have to make sure that uh, the distribution center is not going to be overwhelmed capacity-wise by all the arrivals uh, from Asia at a specific point of time during the year. So now that, that we have you know, the merchandise in, um, uh, in the distribution center, we have to decide what we are going to push. And there is typically uh, a, an initial push for the collection. It's just a matter of consistency. You know, a new collection comes with a new team, a new theme. There is a bit of storytelling going on. There is maybe some marketing operation, and we need some consistency. And thus, there is typically an, an initial push to be done uh, to the stores. And here. Um, the idea is that we have many drivers that are you know, at play. Um, the first idea is what we want is really to boost the appeal of the store. And, that's, uh, and, uh, and for example, an anecdote, and again, another client a decade ago, um, uh, we, we had the discussion because I was a bit surprised. Um, it, it turned out that in every single store, they were pushing one, um, uh, one unit of a white leather bag. And, and it was a bit surprising to me because when I was looking at the sales volume, you know, um, there's leather bags that are brown or black um, uh, vastly, you know, dominate in terms of sales volume. Uh, um, leather bags that are white and, and, by the way, perceived as very fragile, so they look, uh, they look good, but they are very fragile. Uh, they are, they are, the sales volume are very, very low, and that, that was a question for me that was a bit puzzling. Uh, why sell one, one, why push one? unit of the white leather bag in every single store, although the sell volumes were very, very low. And the answer that was given to me, and it, it still resonates strongly, is that because if all the leather bags that you have are basically brown or black, it looks, the store looks a bit sad. It needs you know, a touch of vibrant color so that it's very appealing. So that means that you have to decide to put some products, not because they are going to be sold, but just because in terms of merchandising, in terms of visual effect, they really boost um, the attractivity of the store as a well. And that's, so that's very much you know, one of the concerns that we have here is that we want to maximize the appeal so that uh, the clientele uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, enticed to actually uh, enter the store. And then uh, what we want is to make sure that once you know, uh, the, the client uh, walk into the store that there is a high quality of service. But here, I really challenge, based on you know, this understanding of this, this persona, uh, when we come to quality of service, are we really talking of, um, of for example, service level? And I would say, not at all. Uh, you see, a, a, a client, a woman that enters a store, uh, very rarely has a barcode of, in mind for concerning you know, sort of product reference that, uh, that she's uh, interested in. She might have some plans, some, some general interest, and some ge general preferences. But, uh, but I would say the idea that, that uh, this person has a barcode in her head, I would say it might be, but it's, it's just very, very marginal. Uh, and so the question is not so, and then in the store, you know, if a product ha happens to be out of stock, if there are plenty of very valid substitutes, then um, the problem of the stock out is kind of irrelevant. And, and even worse, you see, if, um, if the, the person walk into the store and the product she's looking for is not there, and the product is not there not because the product is out of stock, but because the product never made its way into the assortment in the first place, then you will never even see 
uh, the fact that you have a, a quality of service problem. So we, we, we have to really think in terms of quality of service, but as we have, have just brief, briefly demonstrated, quali this quality of service has almost nothing to do with, um, with service levels. And so, so we want to have good appeal, good quality of service, and then you know there, there are all the financial drivers. Uh, some products have a, a, a margin. There is margin to be made by uh, by Paris uh, while selling those products, and then there are all the costs involved. You know, uh, carrying cost, uh, working capital cost, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those constitute all the drivers that we have to deal with. And then we have a whole series of constraints that apply you know, to this initial push. Um, first, we have uh, the store capacity. As I, as I was describing, we have, we have power stores, stores that sell really a lot, but they have a very limited amount of floor surface. So it's a bit of a paradox is that the stores where we'd like to push the, the most inventory are also the, the stores where we, uh, we can't uh, technically. And, and, and conversely, at the other end of the spectrum, we have some some weak stores where we have a, 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 a lot of square meters, but uh, it will be not reasonable to push you know, tons of stock just because uh, the store is not really selling very well and it will not be able to liquidate all this inventory. Then obviously we have the plan for, uh, for what we want to push, but we have to accommodate what is already in the store. For example, if uh, the previous you know, collection went exceedingly well and that the store is, is near empty, you, you really want maybe to push even more merchandise uh, because otherwise it's not going to be appealing enough. And conversely, if the previous collection, uh, collection went a bit badly and that you have tons of leftover, then you, you might not even have enough room physically in the stores uh, to accommodate all the, the incoming merchandise. And when it comes to the store capacity, we have to keep in mind that it's, it's not only dependent on uh, you know, um, the, the size of the store, but also of the, the size of the articles, for example. Obviously, you can store many more T-shirts in a store compared to, uh, uh, w uh, to winter mantles, for example. Uh, one is much more bulky than the, than the other one. And also, um, how much capacity you can have in the store depends very much of the sort of uh, equipment I'm speaking of, sort of hardware equipment that you have in the store to put um, the goods on display. So that's, that's very, and, and it goes both ways. You can have you know, equipment that lets you, you know, give the impression of plentiness, which is going to be very, uh, very high interest for um, the weak stores. And some stores that can have, on the contrary, you know, uh, to keep uh, to put um, a lot of stock in, in a very compact fashion, just for the, the power stores that are very limited in in surface. And then we have um, the the routine push, also called you know store replenishment or um, or the dispatch from uh, the the distribution centers. I mean, obviously, between the store routine push and the store initial push, you know. There is, no, there is no absolutely well-defined boundaries. It's more like a spectrum. At the beginning of a, a, any collection, you need to, to push things, uh, but then you need to replenish. And the two are, are you know, um, there is, it's a continuum from, from the two rather than two, uh, than, than I would say, uh, two things that are radically different. But nonetheless, as we start thinking about you know, those, those store replenishment, we have to think about um, uh, the delivery schedules. As I was describing, you know, in this persona, we have um, uh, one distribution center that is serving um, several hundreds of stores. And so the question is, it, is it really of interest to serve every single store every single day? I mean, obviously, there are, there are transportation costs you have to pay um, for, uh, to support the fleet of drivers, but then, Every single day where you're actually making a delivery to a store, you, you most likely have some, uh, some extra cost as well. And the reason being is that, for example, in, in Europe, um, due to uh, traffic reasons, usually deliveries have to be made early during the day. Uh, and so uh, the delivery will be made one or two hours before the opening hours of the stores, which means that if you intend to deliver a, a store on a given day, then there will be somebody, an employee, that will have to, to be present and be paid for you know, one or two extra hours. And if, if the same driver delivers you know, 15 stores, and you have to basically add 10 hours of extra employee pay uh, to, uh, to the circuit, it can add a lot you know, in terms of cost for, uh, for the delivery. And then, um, so that, and that's those, those schedules, you know, they can be established completely dynamically. Again, those are all the options, the, the supply chain options that are on the table on any single day. 
Then um, we, have, we have constraints, uh, both at the distribution center and at the store level. And so le let's consider, for example, um, uh, uh, any unit in stock. And we have to, to think that all the stores compete for the same unit uh, of stocks that are currently held in the distribution center. And just to give you an idea, let's say that we have a, a weak store uh, that had initially, in this initial push, there was one unit for one variant that was push uh, uh, initially during the season. And after 10 weeks, this one unit has just been sold. So technically, this week store is out of stock uh, for this one variant. And in, uh, in the distribution center, we have, let's say, 10 units left of this variant. Should we immediately send yet another unit to uh, this week store uh, to basically solve this stock out problem? Um, uh, it, it's absolutely not quite sure. Uh, because let's imagine that at the same time, we have a power store that has three units in stock. So the, the power store I is not out of stock and doesn't need, you know, it cannot even accommodate more stock at the moment. There are three units in stock, and that's the max that they can accommodate with respect of, of, of the rest of, uh, of what they have in storage. And now, the problem is that this power store might be selling, you know, one unit per day for the same product. And so, if we push uh, this, la this one of those, uh, of those remaining units from the distribution center to the weak store, it's, it's very likely that this unit will take 10 weeks to be sold. And, and worse, um, this unit might actually be sold at a discount because we are going to time-wise end up into the end of the season period with the sales. Although, if we, if we preserve this unit in stock for later replenishment for the power store, then we have a great a uh, great deal of chance to sell this unit within two weeks at a high price. So you see, uh, all the stores compete, and that means that we have forces where it's not always um, you know, uh, you know, profitable to, uh, to solve a stock out problems. Again, the stores are competing for, uh, for the same stock. And then uh, we, we need to think about uh, also uh, input and output problems. From the distribution center perspective, um, what is most uh, efficient is just to have a very flat level of activity, where uh, indeed, if we have a varying level of activity, uh, we either have to basically pay the regular employees you know, over time to, to, to cope with a, the with a spike, and if the spike is too large, then we have to bring in temporary workforces. Um, temporary workforces is not necessarily you know, per hour uh, more expensive, although it can be more expensive than the regular regular workforce, but usually it's not as 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 competent and experienced, and thus the productivity is lower. And thus, in terms of you know of actual cost, um, it's uh, it's uh, it can be much more costly due to the reduced productivity of the of the extra temporary workforce. So from um, from the distribution center, it is of interest to really have a completely flat. Uh, uh, level of activity. And then from um, the perspective of the stores, it's also of interest to have a relatively flattish level of, of, of reception because if we stand on a given day, you know, 20 boxes, then it's going to be a big mess because the, the, the staff might not have the capacity and, and, uh, and, uh, and the hours it takes, uh, the, the manpower it takes to basically put all those products on display on, uh, on, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the day. So it's going to result in a fairly messy store, possibly during several days. So it is, it is um, uh, of great interest uh, for the stores to receive uh, at least somewhat incrementally the, uh, the, 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 the incoming products that they need. And so the drivers, by the way, I'm not going to recap, but essentially the drivers, when it comes to the replenishment, are very much the same. We want to preserve the appeal of the stores. We uh, want to maintain you know, a high quality of service in a, in a very general sense of the term. And uh, we want to maximize you know, the, the financial drivers, which is you know, maximal profitability uh, while minimizing the cost. So that the drivers are, are fundamentally exactly the same. And then uh, as, a, as a tangential note, we have also, I would say, odd logistics by opposition to you know, the, the forward logistics. We have potentially reverse logistics. Uh, let's imagine a situation where uh, the, the distribution center has run out of stock um, for a given variant. Uh, and, uh, but uh, on the e-commerce, this, this, uh, this, this product is still selling very well. And there might be some weak stores that have some um, some units left in stock and they are not rotating, you know, they, they, are, they are very slow movers. So maybe it is of, uh, of interest to basically bring back 
the stock to the distribution center so that uh, it can be you know, sold via the e-commerce, for example. Obviously, it costs money, but it's probably better to sell the product at full price via the e-commerce than wait till the end of the collection and basically give a 50% discount on the product so that it gets uh, finally liquidated. And then we can have also a lot of inter-store, you know, inventory rebalancing that can happen, especially if a couple of stores happen to be uh, physically uh, very close by. You know, if, for example, in a large city uh, like, like Paris or Berlin, it's very likely that we have like uh, something like five stores that are just, you know, uh, uh, one or two kilometers apart. And so, uh, and so it can be of great interest to do some minimal rebalancing between those stores, uh, uh, maybe not even going through the route of the, of the circuit of, uh, of, uh, of the deliveries of the distribution center. And again, the idea is that if something is out of stock in a store and there is a, a little bit of an excess for the same product in another store that is just nearby, it's better to just spread the inventory around. And now, we have already previously discussed, you know, the, the, the pre-season the pre -season pricing, but uh, pricing in a very general sense we match, remains very much an option on the table at any point of time. And uh, we can do a lot of, of demand shaping. Um, and so, for example, we can, we can at any point of time do promotions. And by promotion, I mean, uh, I mean the, the, the word in the, the, in the first literal sense, which is just to promote, to put forward. For example, if you just, you can, product, you can promote a product by just putting it forward more, uh, to make it more visible, more prominent in the store. That can be one way to, to promote a product. And if we see that we have a problem with a product that is where we are at, at the risk of having some kind of overstock, it might be a good time to actually promote the product. And then there is also the option of doing some kind of bundling where we say, you see, we can say, for example, uh, buy two, get the third one for free, or some more complex offering. And then we can even do some kind of um, uh, a flash sales, especially if there is um, a loyalty program in place where you can make some direct targeted offer to, uh, to the clients. And from my perspective, this is also very much uh, a supply chain problem, a supply chain angle, because it's really about the fact that, again, you had initially this, um, this four to six months of, of lead time, which is very large. Uh, uh, fashion is very erratic, so you need to, to be able to accommodate this erraticity. You, can't, you, you can try to you know, accurately see the future demand, but it's going to be very fuzzy at best, and whatever you can do to basically you know, mitigate the areas where you guess wrong in a way, you know, it doesn't matter if you do it with a, with a forecasting technique or another, it doesn't, doesn't matter. If you, have, if you have levers to basically mitigate those, those initial errors, it can be a, a very, very powerful you know, supply chain mechanism. And then obviously you have uh, the practice of doing the, you know, the, the end of season sales, where the idea is that um, you can steer the price down and the game is basically to maximize the volume of sales to be made from uh, you know, the fixed amount of inventory that you have that you hope to basically have more or less liquidated by the end of, uh, of the season so that you can make room for the next collection in your stores. And here, um, we have to think that there are customer habits uh, and, and, that's, and those customer habits and customer perceptions are a double-edged sword. Uh, on the plus side, I whenever you know, a, a, a client show up and buy something from, from the, the brand of Paris, it's, it's, it's very interesting because it creates you know, some kind of, of loyalty uh, toward the brand. You know, the more you buy from one brand, pretty much more or less, the less you buy from other competing brands. So that's very good. But the problem is that whenever you give, especially at the end of the season, a discount, you also create a habit of, of buying at a, a discount. And, and, and the client that has just bought a product at, at a 50% discount might actually, uh, for the next season, start waiting till the end of the collection so that she will actually expect to benefit again from, from the discount. So uh, if, if we go you know, more upmarket than, than Paris, this person now, for example, in, 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 in soft luxury, uh, uh, the brands would typically never do any discounts precisely because of this problem. Here um, we have a mid-market brand, Paris, and so uh, they have to resort to, um, to this mechanism. It's, it's actually quite, um, quite profitable to do so, but, but, we, uh, but we have to take into account those, um, those two aspects of the problems. And, and again, it's a matter of, 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 I would say, supply chain trade-off to be optimized to leverage the, the, the problem, uh, this 
to our best interest. And also, uh, as a, a tiny, tiny transitional note, in the past, um, there was some, uh, you know, there was some limitation on how frequently you could change uh, the price point of your products. I mean, there might be legal reasons. I'm not talking about that. But, uh, but um, you know, on, in an e-commerce, you can change the price of a product on any single day. But if we look at a physical store, um, there is typically some manpower involved if you want to basically re-tag all your products. However, more recently has emerged, you know, electric um, uh, price levels, electronic price levels that let you, you know, reprice your product as frequently as, as you would like to. And so even if it's not overly frequent at present day, if we, if we start, you know, to look one decade from now, it means that we will have these options will be even, I would say, even more uh, prevalent just because we can actually, we'll be able to play, I would say, uh, much more dynamically with those prices because we, the, the, the brand, Paris, will not have to suffer to pay anymore, you know, people to basically re-tag all the products whenever they, they want to change a, uh, uh, the price of a product. So uh, we are already past <laughs> one hour and I've, I've not, uh, and there will be plenty of, uh, of, of other elements to treat. So I, I, I won't have time in this, in this lecture and this person now to cover everything. In particular, I've barely touched the, the e-commerce angle. Uh, e-commerce is, would deserve, you know, a, a fashion e-commerce would deserve a person of its own. Let's briefly say that uh, in sort of problems that we have not touched yet, we the, the returns. For example, in Germany, for a fashion e-commerce, we can easily, you know, expect 50% returns. So one article out of two uh, that is purchased online end up returned to the brand. Uh, in France, this is the percentage is a, a just a cultural difference is much lower. It's something like a, like 10 percent. So obviously this has profound influence on the way you um, you organize your your e-commerce operations and the way you optimize them. And then if you're doing e-commerce, you can do naked sales in the sense that you you don't need to have the product in stock physically to sell it. You know, uh, if the product is just incoming in the container, you can already start selling it. Granted that you're very transparent in terms of estimated time of arrival for your client, that you don't, you know, you don't over promise that you are going to have like a, a delivery two days from now if it's going to take four weeks to arrive. But nonetheless, you can start selling the product even before the, the stock is already there. And then you have the, the showrooming effect where you, you can have, you know, a client that see uh, products uh, in, in a store and they, they really like the product, they really like the fit, but they would have a color that they would prefer, so they, they was maybe going to take their decision in a store, but actually purchase online. Or conversely, there is maybe the opposite, which is um, you purchase online and then you, uh, you get the delivery in the store just so that you can immediately, you know, give the product back if it doesn't fit you. And you're guaranteed that it will be exactly, you know, uh, the, the product that you seek. And then there are also uh, and those were completely excluded from this personnel, all the, the, the problems that relates with the, um, the, the other uh, channels. Um, you know, you, the, there are online marketplaces where um, the Paris could sell its own brand. I'm not discussing that. Uh, Paris might even be selling, you know, a wholesale its, its, its products, so uh, selling the products to other uh, B2B clients that, hap that happen to have their own, re that, that happen to have their own separate uh, retail chains. Uh, there might be also third-party outlets that are co-managed to some extent uh, between, you know, Paris and a, f uh, and a, and a third-party company. And then another thing that I've also completely brushed aside for now is, is uh, all, all the, the intricacies that are related to franchise. Um, uh, typically, fa fashion, you know, retail networks, are, uh, most brands have both a portion of the network that they directly own uh, but also a portion that is that is uh, operated independently by franchisees, and they might be uh, and, and depending on the setups, there might be more or less leeway for the franchisees, you know, to take their own stocking and pricing decisions. Um, and that's but that that would open ourselves to uh, plenty of other questions that we will just uh, brush aside for now. And so, in conclusion, today we have covered quite. A <laughs> quite a, an, an ex, uh, an ex, uh, I would say, uh, a quite a list of supply chain decisions. We have seen all the decisions that are related to, um, to, to, to range planning, to, uh, to purchasing, to all the problem of, of, of finding the right uh, shipment methods, uh, all the things that happens upon reception in the distribution center, 
all the, the things that we have to do for the initial push, for the later, for the route in push, the, the, the replen store replenishment, and all the, the, in of the, and all the, the pricing related problems. And what we can see is that all those decisions, all those supply chain decisions, according to the decision that I've proposed, to, that I've proposed are, are completely entangled. You see, as we have seen, a, a decision that is a, a, an initial uh, range planning decision will have profound decision on what we can do in terms of, of purchasing, which in turn will have plenty of, uh, of, of impact and what we can do in terms of initial, uh, initial push and then replenishment, and, and what sort of risk we are talking with regard to the quality of service or the other stocks and uh, the sort of, of discounts that we'll have to give at the end of the season. And all of that, all of those decisions are very much, you know, entangled. And that's, by the way, this is exactly the essence of, uh, of one of the principles that I introduced, you know, in, uh, in my lecture about the quantitative principles of, of supply chain, where I say that, um, that we cannot, you know, uh, if we, if we uh, try to solve those problems locally, what happens is that we just displace the problems, we don't, we don't address the problems. And so, uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, based on our understanding of, of this person of Paris, we can see that we should be exceedingly skeptical, let's say, with um, all the divide and conquer approach, because we see that you know, a divide and conquer approach due to this entanglement is, is nearly guaranteed to, to miss the point. Um, and also we should be uh, very skeptical about the sort of functional decomposition of the process. For example, if we say that we have forecast, plan, um, you know, uh, uh, and then optimize the sort of sequential functional decomposition of the process, then again, uh, it, it completely violates what we just understand about the, the problem itself and the, and the entanglement that we observe for all those decisions. And so, uh, two weeks uh, from now, uh, so that, that completes, you know, uh, Paris, uh, our first supply chain persona. And uh, two weeks from now, I will be, uh, that will be same date, uh, so, sorry, same day of the week, same, same time of the day. Uh, I will be giving uh, uh, the next lecture about uh, experimental optimization. And again, this is our journey to find um, scientific methods for supply chain, or at least something that is, even, even if it's maybe arrogant to say that those methods qualifies as a scientific method, something that would at least give us more solid foundations when it comes to, you know, the predictable and control improvement of the supply chains. And so now I will actually start looking at the questions. Give me one second, having a, a look. So, uh, so let's, let's have a look. Okay, um, so apparently I'm just looking at uh, what was what was prepared. Uh, ah, sorry, I have uh, I have a problem. No, sorry. Ah, let me see. Sorry. Um, ah, I need to re-enter a password. Murphy's laws. Here we are. Very sorry. Uh, um, so, we have a first question from uh, Pankaj Nenani. Uh, again, I'm very, I'm very sorry about with the names. Uh, um, my pronunciation is probably completely horrible. Uh, micro fulfillment centers are needed in Asia dense cities where space is limited and order to round time is very low, delivery in three hours. Enterprises lose uh, efficiencies in multi story um, uh, distribution center la layout. How to deal with uh, warehouse uh, operations efficiency for multi-story, multi-level micro distribution centers with activity operation and, and getting customized warehouse management software based on process and layout. So that's, that's a very interesting you know, angle. That's something that, is, that was not covered by this person. Obviously, I was, I was focusing on, 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 I would say, on a European setup. Here, what you're just dis describing is really the importance of understanding the problem. So what you're describing is, uh, and again, the topic of this solution is first, to get to the solution, we need to get a better understand uh, understanding of the problems. So if we have, for example, a ma micro uh, distribution center, as you put it, a multi-level, uh, then we have many of extra options that emerge. What, what, uh, what should we, when we receive products, where should we put them, you know, on, on which floor? Obviously, the first floor is much more readily accessible. So, literally, the, the, the topology 
of, of the building start to matter a great deal more, especially if, if, as we can see, it's probably a building that was not necessarily, you know, engineered as a distribution center. It was probably, you know, a building that was kind of uh, recycled for a, a fairly ad hoc purpose that's completely unlike, you know, the, the, the inbound distribution center that I, I put on screen uh, a few slides ago. So here, uh, today, I'm, I'm not going to, to I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm not going to delve into the actual solutions, but, but I would say if we want to stick to this idea of supply chain persona is that first, we need to really characterize what are the forces that are at play, what are the sort of problems. For example, if it's a very small facility, maybe we are very limited in the number of people that we can actually put in the building. You know, if I decide to put, maybe theoretically I can add manpower, but at some point there is like diminishing returns. If I add more manpower, this is just a, a micro uh, distribution center and those people are just going to, uh, um, you know, to, to, uh, there will not enough room to circulate. Then uh, maybe we should start thinking of uh, organizing the storage differently. And maybe we should have something that will be helping people to find stuff easier to, or to, uh, what about, you know, uh, the exact la internal layout and maybe to have like a night shift that is dedicated to reorganizing uh, what is in, I would say, in stock within the micro distribution center uh, so that the, 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 the dead team can be a lot more productive. I mean, there are plenty of other options. I, again, the, the whole topic of this, of this lecture is not to discuss uh, the exact solutions, but first, uh, or, or, or any solution at all, it's, it's really to start the journey by, uh, uh, by expanding our understanding of the problem. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm not giving you the solution that you seek, stay tuned for the later lectures, but today I, I want to stick kind of true to um, the, the, the problem side of things. And then a, a question from Sebastian Hild. What do you think about existing solutions in multi-echelon inventory optimization, especially coupled with demand sensing? Oh, so uh, demand sensing is, is uh, I, I produced uh, a, a, a look at TV episode on that, so I can give you, you know, a definitive answer. Um, this, is, this is literally um, nonsense and, uh, and marketing buzzword. There is like no substance whatsoever. So if you, if you, if you see th those keywords together, demand sensing, you can be rest assured that um, basically the vendor has zero clue about what the hell is going on. That's, that's basically an absolutely, that's, a, that's an absolute given. If you want the proof of that, I suggest to have a look about the demand sensing uh, episode that we produced um, a few months ago on, on Locat TV. And then uh, if we have to think about the existing solution for multi uh, echelon inv inventory optimization. Again, I, I suggest we, we need to start thinking about uh, the, the definition of the problem and, <clears throat> and what, are, uh, what are the characteristics of the problems. And just, just to give you an idea, um, if we want to do this sort of analysis, um, clearly for multi echelon optimization, uh, most of um, the decisions that you need to take are not real time. You know, this is not, this is just like the personnel that I've described today for Paris. There is almost zero decisions that needs to be taken in real time for this persona of Paris. Um, I mean, literally everything that we have discussed, you know, um, you know, most extreme case, we need just a few minutes. Uh, the most pressing decision might be a few minutes, but real time doesn't make any sense. So where do I get that? Is that most um, multi-echelon inventory solutions are software-wise designed around um, relational database that are geared for real-time uh, transactionality. And that's, so that, you see, we have a problem that has something where we have an element of design that is completely fundamental, completely massive, and that will pretty much shape the entire solution. And when you look at this real-time transactionality of the software, if you start thinking about the problem, you would see that the, the need is nowhere to be found. And again, um, uh, uh, in this regard, you know, this, this multi-echelon, so here this is not really a multi-echelon supply chain we are talking about, but I mean, there are, there are a few echelon. It's, it's very limited, it's like a, a two echelon supply chain. But you can see that do we need, uh, uh, do we need real time anything for most of the decision that we're talking about? Uh, absolutely not. Do we need transactionality? I mean, we need transactionality whenever we are selling a product or whenever we are doing an inventory movement during the, the inside the, the distribution center, but this is not what supply chain optimization is about. So again, when we look at those, um, at those existing multi-echelon uh, inventory uh, uh, optimization software, 
my question for you would be start looking at the problem just, do, just like what we did today with, with the persona and start assessing whether the very decision uh, designed, the core fundamental design decision that went into the software, whether they are aligned with the problem or whether they are completely at odds. Uh, and, and my opinionated answer to this question is that the vast, vast majority of the software product that you will find in the market when it comes to uh, uh, multi-echelon inventory optimization, the design is completely at hard, at, I would say, uh, completely antagonize the very problem that we're facing. And you can detect you can detect that by a simple litmus test. You can ask the vendor, do you use a SQL database? If the answer is yes, that you know that the software is just completely misdesigned with regard to the problem. So at least you, you can rule out this vendor and, and just move out to the, to the next one. Then uh, another question from Alexei Tikhonov. Um, when we craft a persona, even though it might look like very realistic, it is a thought experiment. And therefore, therefore we operate in an hypothetical situation. How can we generate data set to study its dynamics? Ha, ah, very difficult. And by the way, uh, to generate synthetic data set that are, that are realistic is exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. I know because at Locad we tried, especially because we have some sample data sets lying around, and it took us a lot of efforts uh, to craft those, although they're they are really not impressive. The easiest way to create actually a sample data set is to real use data and uh, real data and anonymize. But um, that basically, but this question that is asked is, is very, very relevant. And that's, that was exactly uh, the point uh, that I discussed in the, the previous lecture. I mean, the, the way I have engineered this is personal. And as you say, it sounds realistic, but also I believe that contrary to, let's say, a case study, it is very much easy to contradict the persona that I'm presenting. You know, all it takes is uh, a fashion brand that say, you know what, I'm serving women's and uh, I also operate in Europe, so I'm very similar to what you described. And you know what, my distribution centers, um, I, have, uh, I have 500 stores, but I have 100 distribution centers. So your, your estimates, your initial estimates are completely off. Or, you know what, I'm, I'm a fashion company, and, uh, and wha what are you talking about, uh, 10,000 variants? Uh, I, I'm operating, I'm also a women fashion brand, and I have only 50, 50 variants, and this is it, and, uh, and I can be a 1 billion euro company. So you see, uh, the way, uh, the way th this person that cannot be proven correct, but I believe that I gave a great many uh, numbers that can be used to kind of disprove um, the, the person that, or at least, you know, prove that, uh, that it prove its limits, that, it, it, that it's, it's not, you know, the sort of thing that is applicable to, to everything. And, and so, in a way, this person is very exposed. Uh, a supply chain director can just, you know, object and say, well, it turned out that in my fashion brand, uh, the problem that you presented is non-existent. For example, um, um, I operate a retail network and I, I don't have those distribution centers you're talking about. Uh, we, we, we import from China and the deliveries are made directly to the stores. No, uh, no, distribution, centers, no distribution centers whatsoever. So you see, that, that are very solid objections that can undo the persona. So the persona, the idea, that was the methodology that I introduced you know, uh, last um, uh, a, a few weeks ago, was that it can't be proven, but it's maximally exposed so that it at least it's very, it can be very easily contradicted. And indeed, in terms of uh, this is a qualitative approach, uh, and, and unfortunately, that's the limit to this uh, perspective, is that indeed it can be enriched potentially with a synthetic data set. That's a, that's a very, very difficult undertaking. Um, that would make this approach more prone to, I would say, uh, quantitative studies. But don't despair as far, you know, I, I, I took today a very qualitative perspective, but two weeks from now, we will be discussing um, a, a methodology to get, you know, quantitative insight and quantitative knowledge about the supply chain. That's, that's exactly what this uh, experimental optimization is about. And now we have, uh, we have a question of G. Joe John. Wouldn't using stores with low volume sales, suburban stores as pseudo DCs help Paris to improve their stock optimization further at, at the distribution level? What are your thoughts? Um, well, the, the problem is that, uh, yeah, yes and no. The problem is that those stores, they are completely lacking all the equipment. You know, distribution centers are literally, you know, big, fat, complex machines. You know, they, 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 have, they, have, they, are, they, they have conveyor belts 
they have uh, they have packaging machines they have they have tons of things that they can use you know to organize the shipments um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and so the problem with with uh, those those weak stores is that typically first the weak store is kind of a middle of nowhere so it's not necessarily very close to for example a, a highway so it's not necessarily the most practical place to to use it as a, as a hub and then um, there might be nothing really, you know, prepared in the store. Uh, because, and, and then I would even say, in terms of, 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 of square meters, it's cheaper, but it's nowhere as cheap as uh, a distribution center, which is typically just next to a highway, in the, I literally in the middle of, of absolutely nowhere. So that the, the square meters, the, the price is super, super low. But those weak stores, the square meter price is much lower than the, the, the I would say, the, the, than the, the one of the power stores. But we are still talking of, 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 of an area that has a modest commercial attractivity. So the, the price point per square meter is still, is still sizable. If, if you, all you want is do some kind of industrial operations, you just want to do that in, in a place where square meter is, is literally worth next to nothing. Okay, um, so that would be all the questions that I have for today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the audience, and uh, it will be a pleasure to see you uh, two weeks from now for the next lecture. Bye-bye.